WFTN. This is Open Line with today's host, Father Mitch Pacwa. In North America, call toll free 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985. You can also text the letters EWTN to 55000 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Wednesday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. Father Mitch is in the house. If you've got a question, simply pick up the telephone and give us a call. The number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 2883986 if you're outside the United States and Canada your number is 1 205 271 2985 and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1 205 271 2985 you can always send us an email open line at ewtn.com or you can text your question Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Um, wait for our response. Type your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Matt Kubensky and Jeff Burson, handling your social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host is he is every single Wednesday, Father Mitch Pacwa. How are you? Fine. You have some emails floating I around over do. there? I do. I um, do. One is interesting from uh, Yaroslav in Ukraine. First of all, great to hear from you. We are delighted to be reaching to people in uh, Ukraine. And uh, his question is, how should I pray for a good vocation? Two things. One, ask our Lord to show you what is His will for you. What would He want from you, given all the gifts that He's given you and who you are? What is our Lord asking of you? Secondly, pray for a gift of being equal-minded. That is, to be able to say to our Lord, if you want me to be a monk, if you want me to be a priest, if you want me to be married, and in, uh, and in Ukraine, you, if, um, uh, you can be a married priest. Um, if that's what the Lord wants, the Lord wants me to be single. Uh, whatever, Lord, you want, that's what I want. And pray for those two things, to know what God's will is, and secondly, to be equal-minded toward whatever he might want. And the more you seek those two things, the more freedom you give our Lord to make known to you what he's asking. You'll usually not find it by hearing words. Some people do, but most don't. You'll find it by feeling an attraction of peace and a peace that stays with you, not just an initial, oh, that sounds like a great idea, or this would be really fun or something. No, it'll be a peace that lasts over a couple of years. So do that, and if you can find a good uh, spiritual father to help you, that would be great. Secondly, um, do you know why certain Bible translations, from Bradley, do you know why certain Bible translations are not liturgically permitted in certain countries? For instance, the New Catholic uh, Bible translation as a nihil obstat and imprimatur, but it is liturgically forbidden in the Ukraine. Excuse me, in the Ukraine, in the Philippines. Um, uh, Bradley, I don't know the specifics of uh, those the reasons. Here's what I suspect: that the language of the translation is not bad, but it is uh, perhaps not elevated enough. Remember, a number of translations aim at different reading levels. And sometimes, and, and in the case of a place like the Philippines, 
you also have to be able to deal with the role of English as a common language in a country that has many, many different languages. Philippines has a great diversity of cultures and languages, and English serves as a common language. But it has to be uh, something that is similar to what people in the Philippines understand on a normal basis rather than, say, American English uh, or British English. So that would be the issue. And then from Jim in Nashville, uh, are modern Jews, including both Orthodox, Reform, and Conservative, descended from the Pharisaic Jews? Were the Pharisaic Jews the last ones standing when Rome destroyed Jerusalem? The answer to your questions are uh, yes to both, that uh, present-day Judaism is basically uh, descended from uh, the Pharisee, Pharisaic Judaism, the Pharisee party of Judaism, because the Essenes were wiped out by the Romans in 68. You can tell from the evidence at Qumran that they were, that's when they were uh, wiped out. And the Zealots were wiped out in 72. Uh, the last of them took a stand at Matsada, and so they were wiped out. And the Sadducees were wiped out in September of 70 when the Romans took their quarter of the city. A number of Pharisees recognized that the Romans were going to win, and their leader, uh, um, uh, let's see, he's a, um, I think it was Zacchaeus ben, oh, I forget his name right now. It'll come back to me in a second. Yohanan, that's it, Yohanan ben Zakai. Yohanan ben Zakai led a group of rabbis uh, before the fall of Jerusalem uh, out of the city. They told the Romans we're going to cease fighting. By that point, the Romans were glad to see an end to some fighting, so they let them go. And um, that uh, contemporary uh, Jewish movements like the Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox uh, basically come from the Pharisees. And then from Mike in Rochester, New York, Father Mitch, on Sunday our priest preached a homily on the widow's might. He said Jesus was taught by the poor widow. Later he reiterated that Jesus humbled himself and allowed himself to be taught by the widow. Was Jesus taught by the widow? Thank you. Um, he's making that up. I'm afraid there's zero evidence that that happened. Um I never heard of such a thing. Um, you know, not that she was bad or thing. She just was one of the people, and he pointed her out, but it didn't say that he taught her. And I don't know where Father got that from. Uh, he used her to teach a lesson, to be sure, but there's nothing to indicate that uh she had been some kind of teacher of his, especially since we don't even know if she where she was from. Um, if she lived in Jerusalem, how would she be his teacher? He lived up in Galilee, so um, that that uh, that sounds very odd. Um, also, um, Miriam asks: Is it correct to say that the Old Testament was written by Jewish people? What's the difference between the Jewish writings and the Christian writings? Have we anything in common? How did the Old Testament come about? Uh, a couple things. Parts of the Old Testament were written by Jewish people, but remember the word Jewish comes from the word uh, uh, Judah and Yehuda uh, in Hebrew. And that's one tribe out of the twelve. Some of the prophets were from the tribe of Judah. Others were from other tribes, like Hosea uh, and uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah were from the Levite tribe. So they're both priests. So um, it was written by, we, it's better to say that the Old Testament was written by Israelites, which includes the tribe of Judah 
and the Levites, Benjaminites, and others. Um, and the difference between Jewish writings and Christian writings, the Jewish writings came well before Christ, the last of them written maybe in the first century uh, B.C., but they're all written before Christ. And uh, the, the New Testament was written uh, somewhere starting in 52 uh, A.D., so it's after Christ. That's another uh, big difference. And the Old Testament came about as the prophecies were fulfilled, Jewish people recognized it, and they accepted them as Scripture. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Wednesday with Father Mitch. This is Jerry Usher from Take Two with Jerry and Debbie, inviting you to join us on a very special EWTN Thanksgiving. Call the EWTN listener comment line 205-795-5773 and tell us your memories, traditions, and what you're grateful for. Then listen Thanksgiving weekend as we share your messages with a global audience. From our EWTN family to yours, God bless. Father Benedict Groeschel. I must tell you that from what I observe from very young people, all of these blasphemers, all of these mockers are in for a tough time. Because the devil bites his own tail. And I find among young people a growing reverence and longing for God. I find a decline in the cynicism and skepticism around it. Because it had to destroy itself. No one can live on being an enemy of God. It's too crazy. It's too absurd. It's too dark. It's too bleak. God is beautiful. God is holy. Why in the world mock God? EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, Advent is right around the corner. Thanksgiving next week and then Advent the Sunday following. We've got a beautiful uh, piece from EWTN's Religious Catalog. It's a vintage nativity garden flag, and it's a great way to proudly display your Catholic faith in your uh, lawn or garden. It's made of woven polyester and hemmed around the edges for durability. It won't get beaten up by the wind. The fabric can withstand high winds and is more fade-resistant than typical cotton house flags or garden flags. The special item is printed in the USA. It's available now at EWTN's Religious Catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. Free standard shipping. Online orders of $75 or more. That's standard shipping in the continental United States only. Use the code FREE at checkout. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. First up today is Mary Ann in Wayne, New Jersey. (coughs) She is listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. And Mary Ann, if Father Mitch does not die in the next 10 seconds from choking, you'll get to talk to him. What can we do for you? Hi, Father Rich. Uh, Father Mitch, I'm sorry. Uh, Father, um, I, I, I'm a little confused about something, okay? Somebody may be confused. You too? <laughs> Go ahead. What anyway, are you confused I, about? Well, I say the rosary. Uh, every day, at least at least three rosaries, I say. Mm-hmm. And I just lost my daughter. Uh, it was a year in October. And um, the other night, you know, I was um, I was praying my rosary. After my rosary, I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to ask Mary to pray the rosary with me. And I also have a priest friend that I've known for many, many years who is deceased. And I said, you know what? I'm going to ask Father Joe to pray the rosary with me. So I've been doing that. 
I've been asking, you know, my daughter and then Father um, Joe to play the rosary with me. So I was talking to my friend who is a born again Christian, mm-hmm. and um, I so I was telling her, and she says, "Oh no, Marian, you can't do that." She says, "There's nowhere in the Bible that says you can do something like that." I says, "Well, you know what?" I said, "We're we know that we can ask." Our deceased to pray for us. I said, but I don't see anything wrong in that. She said, oh, no, no, you can't. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to call Father Mitch because he knows the answer. All right. Um, here's one of the things. Does this, does your friend who's born again believe that our souls go to heaven when we die? Yes, she. she uh, Wait, are she you sure about, she believes that? Well, she she talks about Jesus. She, we we talk a lot to each other. I know, I know, but but she, see, here's the reason I ask. Some uh, uh, Protestant groups believe that the soul goes to sleep and then wakes up only at the end of time. Others believe, as we do that the soul goes to heaven and is very much aware of what's going on on earth. So that's one of the things you have to find out about her first. Well, you know, she did say something about they sleep. Right. The, I, and she, she and that's why, that. yeah, and that's why I'm asking, you know, find out first what she believes about this. I said, well, um, I'm sorry, my friend, but I'm going to stay with the Bible, where when I look at the book of Revelation, the souls that are in heaven are well aware of what's going on on earth. They're not sleeping. They're awake in Jesus Christ. They're fully alive in Jesus Christ. And that we also see that the souls in heaven are offering our prayers like incense. You can take a look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, and there you'll see in Revelation 5, 8, that the 24 elders have golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. That's in your Bible. And in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, the angel has a golden bowl of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And we see the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6 praying for their brethren on earth. Now, if she doesn't want to believe what the Bible says, I mean, I don't know what her church teaches, but our church teaches that we believe what the Bible says. And if the Bible teaches us that the saints in heaven are praying for us, I'm going to continue asking them to pray for us. How does that sound as an answer? It's okay that I ask my daughter and Father Joe to pray the rosary with me? Of course it is. It's a wonderful idea. Why wouldn't they? I don't know. After talking to somebody like that, sometimes you, not that I believe it, but it seems like it's such a wonderful thing to ask. Yeah, about. exactly. No, no, no. You, we sh- we're told to pray for each other. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. That's what Jesus our Lord says about praying together. So, you, you know, don't don't let her doubts become your doubts, okay? God bless you, Marianne. We appreciate the phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Rolando. He is uh, at the Great Lakes Naval Base near Chicago, listening on WSFI Radio. Rolando, you're on with Father Mitch. Good afternoon, Father Mitch. Good afternoon, Rolando. I, I used to go by that area on a regular basis. Really? Yeah. Uh, we serve, the, we serve the, the recruits, and we are a contractor. Okay. Yeah. 
So uh, I'm, I'm blessed to feeling that we serve the future heroes of America. Yeah, good for you. God bless you for serving them that way. So what can yeah. we do for you today? My question is, Father, what is your personal stand? Or I know the, the stand of the big church, Catholic, mm -hmm. recognizes the Catholic charismatic. Right. Okay? Right. Okay. Now... In my parish, uh, there's a little uh, doubt on o o what I uh, practice uh, because I, I I started joining the uh, uh, it, uh, what do you call that intermediary praying for others. Well, okay, intercessory intercessory, is, intercessory prayer, it, right? Yes. Okay. My my question is, uh, how can I express this? Okay, why is it the church is not encouraging to practice the way we were influenced by the Pentecostals? Not everything, but the uh, bottom line uh, I'm referring to is the real, literally, manifestation of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. when I was baptized the second time, because Catholics were baptized Uh, when they were infant, or even when mm -hmm. they still growing up. So, mm -hmm. to me, I was baptized on the second second baptism of the Holy Spirit after I have confessed. I have after I've been counseled, after I have forgiven everyone of those who have hurt me. Mm -hmm. In other words, I have tried to cleanse myself through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So. That's when I felt the manifestation. As a matter of fact, I'm proud to tell you, Father, I have a gift. Uh, I, I received the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. I, I sit to, my, to, uh, uh, to communicate between my, my, my Creator and me. Mm -hmm. so who can only understand that. Right. So, yeah. words, so maybe it might be a good time for a brief little treatise on baptism, Father Mitch. So, so you're asking about a second baptism then? Yes. Okay, well, here's one problem. What does the Bible say? In Ephesians chapter 4, when St. Paul said there is one faith, one Lord, and one baptism. There's only one baptism. When, you're, when we're baptized, whether as infants or whether as adults, There's one baptism. That's what Scripture says. And we have to be very— This is one of the things I've been working on teaching in my, my classes, or my classes, <laughs> and my TV shows on Tuesday when I've been going through a book, How to Listen When God is Speaking. And I have to be alert that my feelings don't contradict the objective norms of God's Word. I have to go more by what the Word of God says than what I feel. Now, that doesn't mean that your spiritual experience was unreal, nor does it mean that it was bad. But it's not a second baptism. Again, St. Paul is absolutely clear in Ephesians There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And so we, we have that, that oneness there. And after, you know, just like in uh, growing up in, on the natural level, even though you're born into your family, that doesn't mean that you therefore have responsibility to care for the family when you're born. <laughs> They're taking care of you. And as you mature, you begin to gain more responsibilities within your family, and you grow into those responsibilities. Similarly, in the spiritual life, where we're spiritual children, 
we grow and mature. And these kind of experiences of the Holy Spirit do not mean that we didn't have the Holy Spirit, just as no more does it mean that because, say, my parents get sick and I have to uh, take care of them, that now for the first time I'm a responsible member of the family. No, when they started teaching you to clean up your toys, fix your bed, take out the garbage, mow the lawn, all those are stages of responsibility. And we go through lots of stages in our spiritual growth. And these powerful experiences are key peaks that are just getting us ready for the next stages of spiritual growth. But there's not a second baptism, not in the Bible. It's EWTN's Open Line Wednesday with Father Mitch Pacwa. This is Jack Williams. If you missed any part of today's show, catch the Encore tonight at 10 Eastern and check out the podcast anytime at EWTNradio.net and click podcast. Archbishop Cordelione talks about the National Catholic Register. The Register's content is so critically important in the society we're living in now. There's an absence of the practice of religion in public life. So all the more important is it for people to be reading the Register so that they can acquire more understanding of our Catholic faith. I've appreciated the catechetical benefits of the content of the Register. It presents very clear Catholic teaching in a way that is easily digestible. To get six free issues, order online at ncregister.com forward slash radio or call 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. That's ncregister.com forward slash radio or 800-421-3230 and mention code radio. Call or click today. The National Catholic Register. Read faithfully. How are you listening to EWTN Radio right now? Have you ever wished you could listen on a local radio station? Maybe our Lord is speaking to your heart to help make that happen. Don't let a lack of experience hold you back. Find out how you can help start a Catholic radio station where you live. Powered by the truth of the church and EWTN's dynamic radio programming. Email Steve at this address. Radio at EWTN.com. How have your children inspired you to live a better life? We'll discuss that tomorrow on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie. On most of these EWTN stations. Now back to Open Line with Father Mitch Pacwa. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. Next up is Paul in Saginaw, Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Paul, you are on with Father Mitch. Yeah, good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you guys today? Fine. What can we do for you today? Yeah, Father, this is kind of a tricky, touchy question, but I found a couple Bible passages, uh, uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 3 and 5, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, and I'll summarize these passages for you. Uh, it basically says, hold to your traditions of the ancients which you have learned. Now, my question is this, does the, old, does the saying of the old Latin Mass fall into that category of hold to your traditions, even though Latin isn't spoken in any country of the world, mm -hmm. plus it was the language of the ancient Roman pagans and not the language of Jesus and the Twelve Apostles? What's your, what's your uh, answer to this? You know, first of all, when St. Paul speaks of this in um, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which says, Stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word or by letter. In this case, he is speaking about apostolic 
tradition. The Mass in Latin is not from apostolic times, right? Uh, you know it better than I do. <laughs> okay. The Mass, see, in Rome, half the people of the city spoke Greek, and Mass was celebrated in Greek for the first couple hundred years plus. Did you know that? I did not know that. As a matter of fact, that's why we still have the Curie Aleison, Christe Aleison, Curie Aleison. That's Greek for Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And that was the last remnant of the Greek that was kept. In fact, there was a, a, a big uh, split in the church in the third century because they began introducing Latin into the liturgy because people didn't speak Greek anymore. In the first century, it was normal to speak Greek if you lived in Rome. But and, and only, you know, and almost everybody, even the poor, would know some Greek. Uh, it just was that common in the city. But they, by the third century, that was no longer the case. And so that, you know, the Pope began moving the Mass into Latin. And it took over 100 years before it finally took shape. While St. Hippolytus objected to this because he said, we've never celebrated Mass in Latin. Why are we using this vulgar language? We should always celebrate it in Greek. And in fact, St. Hippolytus is, uh, wrote in, uh, down a canon in use in Greek in his day, and that is the second Eucharistic prayer that we use today. But it was originally Greek, but from Rome. And so Latin doesn't fit into that apostolic tradition. It's a bit later. Does that give clarity? It sure does. So in, uh, what is our answer to these people who want the traditional Latin Mass said today? What What do we say to these people? You know— God bless you. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and here's the thing. I have no objection to the use of the traditional Latin Mass. I, I think it's very beautiful. Now, I myself don't celebrate that form because it's, it is too modern for me. At my parish, we use Aramaic. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not kidding. You know, we start tell, off the tell liturgy. Him, tell him why, please. Oh, oh because it's an Eastern Rite Church. The, uh, it's a Maronite Rite Church. And the Western dialect of Aramaic is our normal language, our de, not normal, our default language. Just like Latin is still the default language of the Roman Rite. So I start off the liturgy by Come on, sing along. <laughs> this is how this is how we use Aramaic. And I like the fact that we preserve these ancient traditions. And in fact, Aramaic is apostolic because they spoke Aramaic. But there's also Ethiopian. Uh, that's used in the Ethiopian rite, Coptic in the Coptic rite, Armenian, and Armenia was the first Christian country, and they still use Armenian, uh, and the many Byzantine rites that use Greek or other languages, like Old Church Slavonic. Uh, this is part of being a Catholic church. It's a universal church. And it is apostolic. It goes back to the apostles. And being able to maintain these different languages with their beauty and richness is a good thing indeed. So I'm in favor of using the Latin, um, you know, and I think it should be an option. 
With that being said, absolutely nothing wrong with the Novus Ordo mask. No, in the no, 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 no. And I, I think fair to say that really, the the biggest mistake that we can make in our t- our day and time mm-hmm. is to cast aspersions on those who may prefer a liturgy, That's right. a valid liturgy, in a language other That's than right. what we prefer. That's right. You know, um, you know, I, I, you know, when I do celebrate in the Roman Rite. I celebrate Novus Ordo, and and there's you know the the prayers are the, especially with this newer translation. It's so much better than the one that we did have, and that's to be expected. Just as when they translated the Mass into Latin, it took a hundred years before it got its final form that we now know as the Roman Canon, but it didn't happen overnight. It took time, and and that's going on. That has has gone on with the uh, uh, Novus Ordo, and it's you know the key for the Novus Ordo or the Latin Mass. Because I grew up with the traditional Latin Mass, and we had one priest who could finish the weekday masses in anywhere from fifteen to seventeen minutes. We would have a contest. He was really fast, really fast. And the key, and and I've also been to people celebrating Novus Ordo, where it's not, the the knowledge of the Latin is not clearly present in either the people or the priest. And it becomes mumbled and garbled, and the, 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 the forms of the words are incorrect. You know, I knew, I grew up with it, so I knew it. And in all of the rites, no matter what language they're in, we need to be focused on Jesus Christ, the Lord of Mass. And secondly, we all need to be prayerful. And that the priest must be praying the liturgy as he leads it, and the people must be prayerful as they join in it. That is key. And then to receive our Savior Jesus worthily in Holy Communion, that by coming there in the state of grace, that is what we need to focus on. Does that help, Paul? I say amen, 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 and have a blessed day. Thanks, you Paul. We appreciate same. it. Next up is Susan in Melbourne, Florida. She's listening on Divine Mercy Radio. Susan, thank you so much for holding. Welcome to the program. Hi there. I'm so glad to be talking to both of you. Thank you. Um, yes, my question is, I heard on one of the EWTN news breaks this morning that in the uh, Bishop's Conference, they are considering changing the right of Christian mm-hmm. initiation for adults to the order of Christian mm-hmm. initiation mm-hmm. for adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, first question is, what's the difference between a right and an order? And two, what do you think uh, the change from an RCIA to an OCIA, what do you think that would mean? Yeah, I'm not sure what it would mean. That I'd like to see what else they have to say in this regard. I could make a couple suggestions what I'd like it to mean, which is that there is uh, very good guidance. In some places, the RCIA program has been wonderfully done. In other places, not so much. Um, you know, some things are skipped, and I find I come across people who don't learn everything about, uh, as much about Catholicism as they need to know before they enter. So I think if they can tighten up some of what is being taught, that would be, and get have good oversight, as well as gr- be even better training of the people doing RCIA. Um, that would be good. That would be good. But uh, in terms of the difference between using the word right and order— A rite is the action that you do, the ceremonies that you do in order to become a Catholic. Whereas an order describes the state that you have become. So 
I you know I went through the rite of ordination, but I entered into the order of priests. You know, I have holy orders. So I'm you know, I'm in the order of priests, but I did the rite of ordination. And that would be a parallel kind of thing. Someone who uh, goes through the rite of confirmation is now on the order of the confirmed. And they would speak about the order of the catechumenate because that gives a person another status within the church. They're not just you know, sort of generally inquiring. They're making a commitment to the church, and they belong to that order, and with it comes more rights. So uh, R-I-G-H-T-S. Um, so that's what's going on there. Does that help? Yes, very much. Can I ask you another question? Sure, um, go ahead. Yes. Um, the lady that I sponsored when she came into the church asked me what exactly was the difference between baptism and confirmation. Uh, and, I, and, you know, I really didn't have a good answer for exactly what confirmation does. Okay. In baptism, you become incorporated into Christ, and that's a good word for it, because you enter the body, the, the corpus, uh, of Christ, the church. And this is a very important thing. With confirmation, there is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And this goes back to a question we had earlier with Rolando. In confirmation, there is a gift of the Holy Spirit that is oriented towards ministry in the church. So baptism is oriented towards belonging to Christ and union with Christ. Confirmation is ordered towards serving Christ and using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, matter of fact, Rolando earlier had mentioned it as the gift of uh, pray, praying in tongues. Uh, there's also gifts of prophecy and healing and many other gifts that St. Paul mentioned. Administration is one of the gifts. Teaching is a gift. Being an apostle is a gift. All of these are different gifts, and each of us is given a variety of gifts. And confirmation is ordered towards living out those gifts and service within the church. Does that help? Very much. You're God welcome. bless you, Susan. Bless. We appreciate the phone call. Be sure to check out the Catholic Sphere Sunday afternoon, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can join Brian Patrick as he discusses the Trinity and our Holy Mother with Father David Arroquium, Jose Carlos Gonzalez Hurtado, and Chris Stefanik. That's Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, The Catholic Sphere with Brian Patrick. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Next up is Marie driving through Wyoming, listening on the Catholic Radio Network. Marie, you are on with Father Mitch. Hello, and thank you very much. You're, yeah, what part of Wyoming are you driving through? I wish I knew, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Are you lost in Wyoming? That's a big place to be lost. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm lost. I'm headed. I am headed to what I believe is the right direction. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you a question about sure. Passover. Sure. And the celebration of Passover and how Jesus celebrated it. Back okay. in the Back in the Exodus, I understood, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm okay. sure I am, um, that it was done by families, and if a family was too small, then you could join another family. Right. And it was the father or the head of the household that uh, took the, that did the sacrifice, the priestly ministry, right. so to speak. Um, by the time of Jesus, Jesus uh, celebrated several Passovers, several are mentioned in the Gospels. Um, I'm curious, are these, were they family? Were they not? Was the Last Supper, were his disciples, mm -hmm. or his apostles, right. um, but not a question of Jesus being, he wasn't a Levite, he wasn't a priest. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just a little perplexed on how the Passover was when Jesus celebrated it, 
a year earlier uh, in the book of John, I believe it was, when mm-hmm. he's speaking of yeah, the yeah. bread of life. Uh, matter of fact, did... John is the gospel that mentions the celebration of three Passovers. In John chapter 2, right after the multi- the uh, changing of water into wine at Cana. So that'd be in uh, John chapter 2, I think, verse 12 that he mentions Passover. Secondly, after the multiplication of loaves and fish in John chapter 6. And then thirdly, uh, at the, the end of the public ministry and right before his crucifixion. So those are the, those are the three Passovers mentioned in John's gospel. Now, we don't see in the gospel how our Lord celebrated the first two Passovers. It just mentions that it was Passover time, okay? Um, And they they don't mention it. But with the third one, it's with the apostles. And you are absolutely correct. The norm is that you celebrate Passover with family. By our Lord— Celebrating the Passover with his 12 disciples, he's doing something unusual. But what he's also doing is redefining his disciples as now his family. And you see in the Gospel of John, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And that that redefinition of his relationship with the apostles is one part of why he celebrated it with just the 12 apostles and is redefining his community of his disciples as his family and this and then it's no accident that at the culmination of the Last Supper in John's Gospel, we see the prayer directed to the Father and giving the the apostles clarity that the Father is your Father and that the name of Father is what keeps you together. Father, make them one as we are one. Keep them in your name. So, This is clearly a redefinition of family, uh, uh, a redefinition of uh, discipleship in terms of becoming family. Does that help? It does. I certainly speculate how did the Blessed Mother celebrate uh, her Passovers when Jesus was celebrating with his uh, apostles. And we don't know. She's not mentioned, and how she celebrated that Passover is not mentioned. So uh, that we just don't know. But I think uh, that we can take what I just said about the redefinition of discipleship as family a step further when at the cross Jesus says to the beloved disciple, Behold your mother, and to her he says, Behold your son. He then includes her as the mother of that new family. So that process of redefining discipleship as family is a very important part of um, what's going on. So that's something to think about. I I don't like to speculate about what Our Lady was doing or anybody else. Um, I, I see a lot of people speculate about the news in our own day, and they usually get that wrong. So uh, I leave that. I just don't do that speculation because I don't know. And I'm after 72 years, I am very comfortable with my ignorance. <laughs> Next stop is the Queen City. David is in Cincinnati listening on Sacred Heart Radio. David, you're on with Father Mitch. Ah, thank you, Father Mitch, for taking my call. And Pleasure. Thank you for being, thank you for being a good, faithful priest as well. No, really I try to do my that. best. Yes, sir. And uh, as a fellow hunter, I just wanted to ask you real quick: do you uh, do you get out much this year? I've been out a couple times. Haven't seen anything. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I think they warn before I get there, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I expect to do better. I, good, I good. fully well, expect that, so. That, 
I do have a question here for you, though. Um, I I was speaking uh, with a friend of mine recently, a, a Catholic, and we were discussing the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and in regards to how the Jews pray there for the restoration of the temple. Mm-hmm. Um, and he made the remark that, boy, wouldn't that be awesome to see that temple restored in our day, mm-hmm. so that the Jews can come back and, and worship and offer sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And my immediate thought was, eh, I don't think so. But am I right in thinking that, Father, that that is yeah. not a proper thing? We have an option, to, because uh, I, I think what you are expressing is uh, an expression of a recognition of how many problems there would be. A, the Jewish people would have to figure out who really is a priest. And, you know, the the lines of the priesthood are not that clearly known. So that would be one problem. Secondly, they'd have to start performing the daily sacrifices again. And... This would be a very serious uh, obligation for them, an expensive one. And I've heard Israelis say, oh, we're not, I'm not so sure we want to get back to that. That's, that's from an Israeli uh, Jewish person, uh, and more than one. Thirdly, it has been a mosque since about 700 A.D. And... It's actually been in the hands of Islam longer than it had been controlled by Jewish people. Uh, Solomon built the temple in the 900s B.C., and it lasted for about a thousand years before it was destroyed finally under Herod, uh, after Herod's temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., August of 70 A.D., Now uh, it's been in the hands of Muslims as a mosque for 1,300 years, 300 years longer. And there would be, to say the least, uh, some reluctance on the part of Muslims because this is their third holiest shrine, while the temple is the holiest for Jewish people. I think we need to pray for there to be a lot more peace and understanding going on. Uh, And Israelis right now have a lot of other things to worry about, uh, like Iran's government and uh, some very, very serious threats to their security. I think hesitation about that fulfillment is something that I'll leave in the hands of our Lord. God bless you, David. Thanks so much for the phone call. Michael, Kristen, Mike, Alex, Laura, my apologies, but we are flat out of time, and we are not going to be able to get to your phone calls today. But feel free to give us a call back on another edition of EWTN's Open Line. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? Lord, bless you all and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Mitch Pacwa, our producer, Michael McCall, our call screener, Matt Gubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Wednesday. Back at it tomorrow on Open Line Thursday with Dominican Father Brian Malady. Until we get together then, God bless. God bless.